to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the book of Genesis tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. And what a powerful presentation of creation that is. And it tells us something about God's nature as creator and designer. We welcome you today to our study of the nature of God as we're going to be looking at the evidence that there is a God and He is the God of the Bible, the Creator of all the universe. And so we hope that you'll get your Bible and have it handy as we're also going to reference not only some information from science, but the Word of God as well. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Uh, maybe you'd like to know more about the church or the plan of salvation or New Testament worship. They'd be happy to sit down and open up the Word of God with you, have a Bible study or talk about the scriptures or uh, any way they can help you. They'd be more than happy to do that. And so we encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. Please check out our website thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of Bible study resources. We have lessons on every book of the Bible. We have a host of topical and textual studies as well. All of those are available to you free of charge. You can download them from our website by uh, filling out a free media request form, or if you'd like to have a copy of that in DVD or CD, we'll also send that to you free of charge. Also check out our apps on the App Store for the uh, iPhone and Android. Those are a great way of studying the Word of God on the go as well. Let's think today about God's nature as creator and as designer and the evidence that teaches us there is a God. You know, man has throughout the centuries had various ideas and theories about creation. And if you watch much today on television or science journals or things like that, a lot of it will revolve around the earth being millions if not billions of years old. And some will say there's a big bang that occurred some 15,000 million years ago and, and a first atom or life was born and everything came from that. You know, there's a lot of theories as we said and ideas about that, but often that's all they are is theory. But friend, when we think about looking at the evidence, there is a host of evidence that clearly teaches us the God of the Bible is the Creator and that the design of our universe demands a designer. Hebrews 3, 4 says it this way, Every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. If you're walking out in the middle of a, an area, let's say you're walking out in the middle of the desert, middle of the woods, wherever it may be, and you stumble upon a house. When you see that house, you're automatically going to think people, civilization, somebody built that house. Well, friend, the evidence, the design uh, demands there's an ultimate designer, and the Bible teaches us that is God. And so let's think about for a few minutes some of the evidence for creation and for God as the designer. The first piece of evidence would be the sun itself, the center, uh, the heat source of our universe, the sun that provides life, also gives us evidence for creation. Now, what is the sun? The sun is basically a huge hot star. It has a diameter of around 865,000 miles. The sun is about 93 million miles from Earth, and it's a, at its core, it's an astonishing 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't even begin to imagine how hot that would be. Each square yard of the sun's surface 
emits about 130,000 horsepower in heat. Now you imagine a really fast car. We're talking about 500 horsepower. That'd be amazing. And yet every square yard of the sun's surface has about 130,000 horsepower when you convert that from heat. Well, someone says, okay, that's all good and well, and that's good information, but how does that teach us about creation and design demanding a designer? Friend, I want you to think about this. Earth, human beings, this planet is at exactly the right distance from the sun for life to exist. I'm not talking about kind of, sort of. Exact, we, are, we are placed at exactly the right distance from the sun for life to exist. Now, did that just happen by accident? Think about this. If the Earth's temperature were 50 degrees hotter, then friend, we'd all be like living in the Mojave Desert or the Sahara Desert. If the Earth's temperature were 50 degrees colder, it'd be similar to living in Antarctica. How is it that we got at exactly the right distance, right place from the sun for all life to exist? Did it just accidentally happen that way? No, this suggests design and a designer. This teaches us that God placed us at the exact right precise spot for life to exist when He created us. It's not just happenstance or chance or evolution that we just kind of fell in. No. Design demands a designer. A little closer and it'd be consumed. A little further, and we'd freeze to death. You're at the exact right spot in the solar system, in the universe, from the sun, for life to exist. Again, just showing evidence that this isn't just chance or evolution or things like unto that. Let me give you another evidence. The moon is also a great piece of evidence for creation. The moon is about 2,000 160 miles in diameter. It is approximately 239,000 miles from the earth and it is the moon that controls the ocean tide. How then do we learn creation from the position of the moon and the earth? Well the moon also is positioned at just the exact place in the solar system in relation to the earth to keep the ocean tides from being too much or too little. Now you think about this, if the moon were off just a little, the earth would be flooded with water going everywhere. If it were off the other way, again, we'd be like in an arid desert environment everywhere. It's not just an accident that the sun and the moon are at the exact right place for earth life to exist with heat and with the ocean tides and how that works in with life. There's just too much evidence over and over again to show that the earth was placed at the exact right spot. It was designed by a designer at the exact right spot for life to exist. Let, let me give you another example. The earth itself shows great evidence of creation. Uh, for example, in orbiting the sun, the earth departs from that orbit from a straight line by about one-ninth of an inch every 18 miles. If the Earth's orbit or departure changed to one-tenth of an inch every 18 miles, we'd freeze to death. If, the, if it changed to one-eighth of an inch, uh, we'd be incinerated. How is it that that departure by one-ninth of an inch every 18 miles works out perfectly for life to exist? Is that just chance or happenstance? Well, no. Another great evidence of creation is the axis or tilt of the earth in relation to the sun. Did you know that the sun, the earth travels around the sun at an amazing 1,000 miles per hour? Can't hardly even begin to fathom that right now, while we're standing here, the earth is moving around the sun at 1,000 miles per hour every year. Uh, every day, the earth travels 25,000 miles and about 9 million miles in a year. But here's what's unique. The earth is slightly tilted on its axis at 23 and a half, at a 23 and a half degree angle. 
Now, as you can probably imagine, if it were 23 degrees, we would all burn to death. If it were 24 degree tilt, we would all freeze to death. Not only is it in its rotation and, and its distance from the sun in relation to the moon, but even on its axis, it is set just perfectly. 23 and a half degrees is exactly where it needs to be for life to exist. Now friend, the question is, did all that just happen by chance? Well, no, there's so much evidence it clearly shows God is a creator of mankind and the designer. And so moving away from the earth and the sun and the moon, let's think about some of the evidence for creation uh, from the human body. The human body is a marvel of science in and of itself, and it shouts out creation, design, and a designer. For example, the human body is composed of over 250 different kind of cells. Each adult, every adult, has somewhere around 100 trillion cells in his body. Some of these cells are so small that 20,000 of them could fit in a standard letter O on a typewriter. You see an O on your screen from your monitor in a Word document and imagine 20,000 cells could fit in that. We say, well, how does that teach us about creation? For in each cell, uh, of those 20,000 cells of which could fit in the standard typewriter letter O, each one of those cells contains a database of information larger than any library today. Evolutionist Richard Dawkins noted, the cell's nucleus contains a digitally coded database larger in information content than all 30 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica put together. And this figure is for each cell. If each cell has a database larger than any library and 20,000 of them can fit in the letter O on a typewriter, a friend, did that just happen by chance? Who coded? Who coded every cell? Who put that massive database of information in there that's larger than any library? Are we going to think that that just happened by chance and happenstance? Well-known atheist Carl Sagan suggested that if you were to count every word in every book in the world's largest library, some 10 million volumes, you would find the same amount of information as in the simple cell. Now, friend, is anybody going to suggest that the world's largest library just evolved, just kind of happened over billions of... No. That collection of information, the building of that library, the putting of book by book on shelf, there was a design and a designer, there was a library builder, there was a book writer, there was intelligence involved in that whole process. Nobody doubts libraries. No one doubts the Encyclopedia Britannica, and yet our bodies in each cell contain trillions of amounts of information, and somehow we say that just happened by chance? Friend, we don't use that same logic when it comes to other areas of life, and so consider that. The human body is also a great proof of creation as it relates to the skin of the body. The skin of, say, a 150-pound man would cover an area of 20 square feet. Our skin makes up about one-sixth of a person's body weight. One square inch of skin contains six million cells, a hundred sweat glands, 5,000 sensory corpuscles, 200 pain points, 25 pressure points, 12 cold sensitive points, and two heat sensitive points. And yet when you look at the purpose of the skin, you can see the hand of creation. For example, the skin is a protective layer that keeps harmful bacteria from getting into our body. Without your skin, you'd be eat up by bacteria. Friend, if we evolved, how did we survive bacteria getting through our skin during that process? There's too many holes in that. The skin is also a waterproof layer that holds in the body's fluids. 75% of a human's body is fluid. The skin is what keeps all that from coming out. How did the process of evolution work during that time frame if your body's evolving through that? 
Well, again, you've got a lot of problems with theories like that. Skin, also with the pigment melanin, acts like a light filter. It filters out ultraviolet rays. Well, how did we survive the process of evolution, if that's true, as the body is learning? Again, you've just got a whole lot of problems that relates to that. You know, another great proof of design through the human body is the human eye itself. The human eye processes 80% of the information we receive from the outside world. The eye can handle about 500,000 simultaneous messages. In an average day, the eye moves about 100,000 times. Milligram for milligram, it is one of the strongest muscles in the body. For example, the legs would have to walk 50 miles to match milligram for milligram what the muscles of the eye are doing every day. The cornea, which takes care of most of the refraction, uh, it's got a lens that serves to focus items that we see at varying distances. The iris and the pupil of the eye work together to let in just the right amount of light. There are two opposing set of muscles that regulate the size of the aperture. The image moves through a lens that focuses it on the retina. I mean, just a whole lot going on in the eye. The image is then picked up by some 137 million receptor cells that convey the, uh, the message to the brain for processing. What you see has to be translated by this and into your brain. And those cells and 7 million cones convert light into a chemical signal which travels along the optic nerve to the brain. Now friend, I want you to think about Everything the eye does. We don't think about it because it just kind of happens. But what your eye does, what you see, and how that's converted chemically in your brain, that's an amazing process in and of itself. Did you know that there is actually an invention that is based on the human eye? And that invention is the camera. The human eye is truly a, a marvel of creation. For example, on a camera, you have a lens cover. On your eye, you've got an eyelid. On a camera, you've got a lens, and your eye has a lens. Camera has a close-up and a wide angle, has a telephoto. Your eye has all that. A camera has what we call an autofocus, and yet your eye has ciliary muscles and a lens which do the same thing. Camera has a light meter, and yet your iris and pupil do that for the eye. A camera has film, the eye has retinas. Camera has black and white. The eye has rods. Camera can shoot in color. The eye has cones. A camera has a processor. We have the brain. Now friend, I want you to think about an amazing digital camera today. You think about that big, beautiful camera that takes those wonderful pictures. Most of our cell phones today have a camera that's just amazing in and of itself. Takes wonderful pictures. You see a camera. What do you naturally think? Do you, when you see a digital camera, do you go, hmm, I wonder how many millions of years that took to evolve? No. You see a camera and you think camera maker. Somewhere, intellect, a designer, somebody really smart put that camera together. And yet the invention correlates with the design of the human eye and is in some ways based on that. Why is it that we say for a camera, camera maker, and yet for the human body, we want to say it just evolved over millions of years. Prominent evolutionist Robert Jastrow had this to say about the eye. He said, the eye appears to have been designed. No designer of telescopes could have done better. It's hard to accept, that evolu it's hard to accept the evolution of the eye as a product of chance. And friend, that's exactly right. To say that somehow it just happened that way we just don't think that way in any other area of life. And so the human eye also cries out for creation. Then I want you to think about the brain of a human. The human brain also shouts out to us that there is a creator. What is the brain? Well, the brain is basically a virtual warehouse of information. Every person's brain has the equivalent of 20 million books of information inside it. It's been suggested that it would take a bookshelf 500 miles long 
to store all the information uh, in your brain. 500 miles, if you can imagine that, is a long distance. And yet, does anyone doubt the vast libraries of information we have today? I mean, you think about a, a really big library, long library. You're not going to think, well, that just happened. Well, friend, the human brain carries far more information than that. And yet, somehow we think that just kind of happened. Did you know that the human brain can take in 100 million images per second? That's almost hard to fathom. Fast computers take in 10, 20,000, maybe more today, uh, images per second. And yet the brain's processor would be the equivalent of a 168,000 megahertz processor. Computers today are pretty fast, but not that fast. And so when you think about the brain, it's also very fast in its uh, ability to process. You think about a really fast computer today, whatever that megahertz may be, and we think, wow, IBM, Dell, Intel, somebody made a really fast processor for that computer. And yet the brain is faster than that. And we somehow look at the brain and the human body and we think, well, evolution happened over me. No, it just doesn't make sense. In other areas, we don't think that way. For example, the watch that I'm wearing today, this watch, if you're walking out in the woods and you see this watch, Casio watch, you see this watch laying on the ground, you're naturally going to think, somebody lost that watch and if you think about it a little more you're going to think watch equals watchmaker somewhere along the way Casio made this watch well when you think about that watch and all the intricacies of it you're right because it is a really a technological marvel in a lot of ways keeps sec keeps time down to the milliseconds as it were and, and someone designed that very intricately and yet the human body is far more intricate the human body is far more detailed, far more dependent upon the processes to work right than any watch could ever be. And yet, we just don't often think about the human body in that way. The human brain is a great example of that, and it's seen in, in many ways. Humans, friend, humans are not. You, you can look, at, there are multiple books, multiple evidences, great studies about this, but when you look at all the evidence, you do not come to the conclusion that humans are the product of millions of years of an evolutionary process. Humans are the intricate climax and pinnacle of God's creation. When you look at the evidence, the evidence shouts out to us that there is a designer. As we said, Hebrews 3 verse 4, every house is built by someone. He who built all things is God. God is our creator. He's our maker. He's the father of our spirit. Zechariah 12, 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, verse 9. And it is God that will one day be accountable to. Man is not accountable to himself. Man is not an accident of an evolutionary process. Man's just not happened to be here because of billions of years of time. God spoke. The world came into existence. God created man in his own image. Genesis 1 verse 26. God breathed into man the breath of life. Man became a living being. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. And friend, it's God that I'm responsible to. I want you to think about the practical application of there being a designer and a creator and that creator being God. And friend, here's the practical, practicality of that. If God created me, and I am not the design or I'm not the product of an evolutionary process of billions of years, then friend, I'm God's creation. And as such, I'm amenable to Him. I'm responsible to obey Him. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, it's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, and that's going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? He's my designer. I'm amenable and responsible to obey Him. The second practical lesson is this. 
if God is our creator and the evidence demands that verdict, then friend, we're responsible to not only obey God, but to honor him. I want to praise and honor and magnify God with my life. Isaiah 43 verse 7, God said, Everyone whom I've created, who's called by my name, I have formed him for my glory. I'm here to honor, magnify, and praise the name of God. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, Whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God. My life and yours ought to be lived in such a way that we bring praise, honor, and magnificence to the name of God which He so greatly deserves. And then a third practical lesson from God as the designer is this. Since God did create man, and I am His product, I am His creation, I need to realize why I'm here. Why did God put me here? Friend, God put me and you here. God created us to prepare now to live with Him for eternity. Now is the time to get right with God and to prepare to live with Him for all eternity. Solomon would say it this way. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about? Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is your chance. This is my chance. This is our opportunity to prepare to live with God. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you today to become one, to believe in Jesus as the Savior of the world, that He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him, John 14, 6. To recognize that our lives can't be lived just any old way we want to live, but that we've got to live according to God's way. And that may mean that we have to repent and amend our ways and do what God wants. Luke chapter 13, verse number 3. Acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior with your mouth. Romans 10, verse 10. And then do what the Lord said to have your sins washed away. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. And thus we want to give God the honor and the glory He is due, for the evidence does demand God is our creator, and let's praise Him for our, that creation. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee 37111 the Gospel of Christ